So, you know, obviously uh, there was uh, some headlines that, that, that and, and some conversation with the DA's office. I spoke to uh, Manhattan DA's office late last night about an accidental discharge that took place during the operation that we did up at Columbia University, uh, specifically uh, Hamilton Hall. So with me today, who will walk us through uh, that accident of discharge is Chief Valdez. He is the commanding officer of ESU. I'll let him walk us through, you know, how that came about. And then we'll take, uh, you know, four or five questions on, on the incident, stay on topic. And, uh, and, and, and that's it. All right, so this is Chief Valdez, commanding officer of ESU. Thank you, Commissioner. Good morning, everyone. I am Assistant Chief Carlos Valdez, Commanding Officer of the Emergency Service Unit. On Tuesday, April 30th, ESU was tasked with breaching, clearing, and securing Hamilton Hall at Columbia University, which at the time was occupied by protesters who had overtaken the building and barricaded themselves inside. This was a large-scale, complex, and dynamic operation designed to both overcome the people inside with minimal physical force, while at the same time containing them to where they were located, eliminating their access to other parts of the building so that arrest teams could move in, place them into custody, and remove them from the building. Our assignment on that evening was to clear their entire building of anyone who was not supposed to be there. This included many offices used by the faculty and administration, some of which were locked and required us to force entry. The situation was fluid and at certain times under low light conditions. During the course of this operation, while clearing an unoccupied vacant area of the building on the first floor, one ESU member, a sergeant, did unintentionally discharge one round from his firearm. The sergeant was attempting to assist other officers in gaining entry to a locked office to make sure there was no one hiding inside. The front of the office consisted of a metal frame door and a large glass non-transparent window. Gaining access to the office through the window ensured the least amount of damage to the structure as opposed to cutting open the metal door jam. Once the window was broken, the sergeant attempted to reach through the hole in the glass to unlock the door from the inside. To do this, he transitioned his firearm from his dominant right hand to his non-dominant left hand. When the sergeant transitioned his firearm to his non-dominant hand, he began to use his dominant hand to gain entry through the window, which is when the unintentional discharge occurred. The bullet traveled through the office glass and into the office they were attempted to gain access to. After the firearm discharge, the sergeant immediately assessed his team and ensured that nobody was injured. The team gained access to the office and found that there was nobody inside. In this case, the bullet landed on the floor of the office and didn't travel anywhere else, so it was apparent that it had struck no one. The officer continued with his assignment, as we are trained to do, and notified his supervisor at the first opportunity. At no time were any police officers, members of the public, or any protesters in danger. This was purely unintentional. With that, I would be happy to take any questions that you may have. Okay, the commissioner will take the last two. Now, as, f as far as your first question, so we use a, a, a lighted uh, firearm, side firearm. It, it, uh, it, it provides illumination to uh, make better decisions under difficult circumstances. So that's why we use a firearm or sidearms with, uh, with illuminating flashlights. If that answers your question. Why not just use a separate flashlight? Well, listen, every. So every job is different. Uh, it is very fluid. This was a very fast moving pace uh, job that was ongoing. Uh, the officer decided to make entry and use his, well, while he was clearing the room, we have to prepare for anything that may be in that room 
that could be possibly be of harm to the officers or to civilians. With that, we train our officers to unholster their weapons and clear the room at the same time. We are equipped with those uh, lighted guns so it frees up our hands in case something else may come up to us. If that answers your question. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. So, Linda, the other, the other thing I think that you, that you asked is uh, the second part was, what again, do you mean the number two question? Uh, the second part was when is the bounty plan Yeah, so right now, so yeah, the DA has it, and the, I, I, we don't have an, any intention on and releasing body cam on accidental discharge. We never do that, and I don't think we're going to do that here just because it's a newsworthy incident thing that we're not going to change that protocol. We're not going to release body cam on accidental discharge. Thank you. And then the other part of the question is why didn't you post the objectives on Wednesday at the press meeting because obviously there's going to be a reaction to that tomorrow. Why not just talk about it then instead of now? Yeah, I think we, we could have talked about it, but I don't, I don't recall it coming up organically in that press conference, we normally don't do any kind of release on an accidental discharge. I do see how some are saying, hey, this is a operation that people were watching around the country, but our protocol normally on an accidental discharge, and especially when I talked to the police commissioner about it, I asked, hey, anything abnormal about this accidental discharge other than this is a newsworthy operation? Was there anybody in the vicinity of this accidental discharge? Did anybody even hear it? Even though the ESU members didn't hear it, there was nobody in danger, there was nobody struck. And for us, this is an accidental discharge. We, aver we average about eight of these a year. And so my goal here was not to just try and make a story. My goal was to see, is there a story here in terms of, hey, is there something abnormal about this? And it wasn't. But we, 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 free, we would have talked about it. We gave it to the DA. And yeah, I knew it would come up eventually because it always does. So it was no rush for us to talk about this. And you have to remember, the same night, the next day, while everybody else is thinking about just, hey, we could have addressed that at a press conference, the reality was that I was dealing with uh, CUNY that night. Because when I, we left Columbia, we went right up to CUNY to clear out another couple hundred people up there. So no, I didn't make the decision that we wanted uh, to address the accident or the discharge at that time. Because we normally don't address them, period. Uh, Mary Lynn? No, that is uh, emergency service unit officers are equipped. All their sidearms are equipped with a lighted firearm. So that, that is standard practice for us. Well, so the country, so. I, many police agencies use that, uh, especially tactical entry teams. Well, we had individuals that were barricaded at a location. That is what ESU officers do. They gain entrance to barricaded situations, not just for perpetrators or armed perpetrators, but for people who need assistance uh, to handle aided and to handle emotionally disturbed people. So we were tasked to breach a building that was barricaded and then to secure the, the protesters that were in there. And the other thing we always say at these press conferences, is we this is New York City. We have, and the mayor loves to say, we have, you know, eight and a half million people, eight and a half million opinions, all right? But if you ask tactical, uh, experienced people around the globe about making these type of entries anywhere, where you don't know what's on the opposite side of those doors, where people have been barricaded uh, for several hours, if not more than 24 hours, and not know what to expect, I don't think any of those experts will tell you that it's a good idea to go in there uh, without your proper equipment and, and be ready for anything that you may encounter. But did you guys have any intel that they were on? That's why you go prepared for anything. So you didn't have any intel. All right, we're going to move on. Wait, no, no, hold on, hold on one second. We just, I think we told you the intel. The intel is that there are barricaded individuals who've been there for a long time who dismantle security cameras and you don't have eyes and ears in there. So yeah, 
That is intelligence. Go. James Ward. Sergeant. But why was the sergeant's finger uh, on the trigger? And just talk about what happened going forward. Is there some sort of uh, disciplinary action? Sure. To so, that? Yeah. ESU training or specialized tactics school is a nine month training course, which is probably the longest, one of the longest in the country, definitely the longest in this department. Ten weeks of that training is dedicated to heavy weapons and tactics training. Um, in, when incidents like this happen, and it's called an accident for a reason, correct? It's called an accidental discharge. The, uh, the sergeant at the time was trying to clear an area, an unknown location that was dark. Uh, so he moved, he made the decision to transition his firearm from his dominant hand to his non-dominant hand so he could better try to gain access to the office. Uh, with that, he unintentionally uh, pulled the trigger of his weapon and discharged the firearm. Uh, moving forward, we we will obviously counsel the officer and send him to retraining and reevaluate him, and we, we'll take it from there. He's a very experienced officer uh, in the unit. He's been a, a sergeant in the unit now for almost eight years with a, an impeccable record. Yes. Right. Well, 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 sir. Under the conditions, I mean, it's a high-level stress situation. Uh, when he transitioned to his left hand, he accidentally uh, pulled the trigger. That's the best I, I can't tell you. I could get into the sergeant's mind. So, All right, this will be our yeah, last question. Yeah, Kelly, we have one. Carlos, Carlos, hold on, hold on a sec. Carlos, who are you calling on for your question? Kelly, we have one call. Okay. Yes. I'll, I'll work backwards. Uh, I think the chief said that this is standard for his ESU teams and his special operations people. It is not standard for our patrol people. So, uh, no, many of the patrol people you saw going in who weren't making the breach of the building, uh, their firearms are not equipped with this flashlight. Um, and then uh, your other question was... Well, well, it's a it's a it's a joint it's a joint decision, and and it's one in which it's been like that for many years here. I don't and I don't recall many many requests other than I'm, the newsworthiness of it is not the only thing that the police department has to think about. All right, this is an accidental discharge. This is the first time I'm being asked about an accidental discharge, probably in years. Uh, I've been, I was in DCPI for four years prior to this as a lieutenant. I don't recall anybody here asking me about an accidental discharge. So just because it happens at a place where we're doing an operation where now it's at a place where we consider newsworthy, now we care. But accidental discharges happen every single year, and we average about eight a year, and we don't get requests on them. So that policy has been pretty standard, and if you do ask about it, we'll talk about it like we're doing right now. Can I just say the type of gun yeah, we're good. Uh, okay. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. Uh, you can follow up. Just any questions. If you